everyone. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn today. I'm so excited to dive into our topic. Our topic for today is forgetting the pecking order, why there's power in asking for help. We've got a great guest with us here today. We've got Margaret Heffernan. Margaret has run five different businesses in the United States and the UK. All but one of them have been media companies. She now writes, speaks, and blogs about business leadership, management, innovation, and creativity. Her TED Talks have been seen by over 13 million people. She mentors senior and chief executives and is a professor of practice at the University of Bath School of Management. She has published six books, with her most recent book being Uncharted, How to Map the Future Together. Margaret, thanks for being here. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. So I think one of the topics that you bring up in your TED Talk, and by the way, for our audience, if you haven't seen her TED Talks, I highly recommend them. They are fantastic. But one thing that you bring up is this notion of there's power in asking for help. But you know, one of the things that are, is, from what I'm hearing, at least within your presentation, is that there's this underlying theme that a lot of leaders struggle to ask for help. And so I guess I'd be curious, you know, just to kick things off, why do many leaders struggle to ask for help? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and largely it's because people feel that it's a sign of weakness. You know, if I'm the CEO, if I'm the leader of the team, I'm supposed to know everything. Well, I think first of all, that's a terribly flawed model of leadership. No leader, no matter how wonderful, knows everything. In fact, I would say that, you know, the chief task of any leader of any group is to create the best group of people around them so that collectively the team knows as much as they possibly can know. But that isn't reserved to just one person because if it is, of course, that's terribly dangerous because if that one person doesn't have the answer, then nobody has the answer. The whole premise of organizational life is that groups of people can know more and solve for more and see more solutions than individuals working alone. So, but I think nevertheless, you know, the way that we often write about business, the way we write about successful leadership is that it tends to be a heroic soloist, right? We write about, um, you know, we write about great military leaders. We write about George Washington. Um, you know, we write about Nelson Mandela. We write about Franklin Roosevelt a pair who apparently wrote the New Deal single-handed, you know. Um, General Patton, clearly all his victories were his single-handedly. And, you know, this is clearly a very outmoded view of leadership, but, you know, you still get it in the great kind of biographies of business leaders. I remember when Steve Jobs died, some, a friend of mine said that her daughter said, well, who's going to make the iPads now? <laughs> And, um, and many people, I mean, to be fair, you know, um, not Isaacson, but many of the people who kind of ruthlessly exploit the name of Steve Jobs to get traffic to their blogs, you know, they write about him as if he was the only person with any ideas at Apple. Um, so this idea we have of, of, of leadership as a heroic solo activity has lots of bad side effects, but one of them is it means that people who've grown up with that narrative tend to think, well, if I don't have the answer, then I'm failing and I'm a weak leader. I think in fact, quite the opposite is true. And I think I first learned this when I was interviewing a woman who was a firefighter and also an Ironman uh, contestant. We talked about doing an Ironman where she was just absolutely on her knees and finally had to ask a, a teammate for help and she said she learned in that moment from the look on his face that asking for help is a gift to the helper it's a profound mark of respect if i think you can help me what greater compliment is there than that and so in many ways it is it really forges very tight bonds between people so not only is it not a sign of weakness, it's a great way of strengthening your relationship with the people around you. I think the other thing is people often fear that the answer will be no, but there's a really beautiful, very old, but very beautiful experiment that was done by the brilliant social psychologist, Stanley Milgram. And he's very famous, of course, for his obedience experiments. 
but he did a whole bunch of you know brilliant less known ones and one of them was he asked his students uh and i think this was at columbia or nyu at the time to go onto the new york subway and without giving a reason ask somebody if they could give up their seat for them now this was at, at a time in the 60s or 70s when new york was a pretty scary dirty dangerous place and apparently some of the students were so scared that they were physically ill but at any rate what the experiment showed almost everybody gave up their seat without asking why in other words people will help if they can and so asking for help is a gift it's a sign of respect and you know quite frankly it's the best way you're going to solve your problem if you have no idea of how to how to answer it yourself and the last thing i'd say in this you know i've run companies in the uk and the us and i remember one of the things i most loved about working in the us was whenever i would talk to people about what i was doing or some my business idea i had almost the instantaneous first response would be Oh, that's so cool. How can I help? It's a wonderful, wonderful, optimistic, generous response. And I think it's important to realize most people will help if they can. And when they have helped you, you now have a deeper relationship than if you'd sat there all by yourself in your tent trying to figure out something that you can't figure out. I love that. I think there's a ton of power in asking for help, but there's one thing that I've started noticing that is interesting that's that's happening in, with a lot of leaders that what I'm finding is they think it's an appropriate thing to ask, but in reality, it is garnering the opposite. And that is asking others, what can I do to help you? How can I help? Yeah. And I, exactly. and I know that sounds crazy, but I've seen a ton of leaders come to me and say, I go to my team and say, how can I help? And no one says anything. Everyone just says, nothing is wrong. And I think what I'm observing is it certainly, it seems like by asking somebody, how can I help? It insert, it assumes that you, the direct report, need the help. You are the person who's deficient that I need to come in and save. Whereas if they were to reframe that question as to uh, what aspects of your work could use greater clarity for myself or other team members, that assumes that it's my fault and I could be doing better for you. I don't yeah. know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's partly true. I think, I mean, I think it's better to interpret it generously. I mean, I, um, I'm running a big project at the university where I teach and one of, and I, one of my students said, is there anything I could do to help? Um, and I mean, there quite spectacularly wasn't, right? Um, but I, and he's quite a difficult character. But I chose to interpret that as he could just see, you know, here's somebody kind of running around like a crazy person, you know, if he could help, he'd like to. So I think it's important to interpret it correctly. I also think it's a really relevant question for um, a boss or a supervisor to ask, which is if you're really struggling with something, maybe there's something I know or someone I someone I know. Um, that could help you or just cut to the chase a lot faster and it's quite interesting because i'm doing a lot of teaching on kind of how to influence ecosystems at the moment and i'm very struck by how rarely executives understand that okay if i'm trying to get into this company or i want to work with this company or i want to get more attention from this organization how rarely they'll say, hey, does anybody know this organization? I'm trying to get in and I'm really stuck. Um, I've written very extensively about a company named Arup, which is a global kind of engineering and construction company. They're very famous for building the most impossible buildings in the world. And one of the things that they say has made them so successful is that they have a culture of helpfulness within the organization. And what that means is that when anybody, I mean, it's a hierarchically very flat organization anyway, but whenever they see people struggling with something, you know, the, the question everybody will ask is, can we help? 
you know, it may not be my project, but maybe there's, and maybe I don't know the answer at all, but I might know somebody who knows the answer. I might know something that will kind of give some clarity to it. And I think the other thing I would say is, I'm very intrigued by the fact that open innovation platforms where people post problems that they can't solve, often find the problems are solved working by people um, solved by people who are working outside their domain expertise. Classic example of an oil spill problem that's solved by a cement engineer, um, not because he knows anything about oil spills, but he does understand a lot about viscosity. So it's really important to remember that the people around you who may not have your expertise or special knowledge may be able to see the problem in a different light and may say something or ask you something in return that allows you to see it in a completely different framework, mm -hmm. which will galvanize your own thinking. So it's never a bad question to ask. And I don't think you should ever interpret it as any kind of criticism or chastisement. Um, I think you should, you do well to interpret it generously. Yeah, I know. I love that. I think, though, even within that, there's this thing that needs to be in existence, which is something that you've described in your TED Talk, which is social capital. There needs yeah. to be that layer of respect. Or I guess I would love to learn from your perspective is what are the difference between psychological safety and social capital? Um, mm. And yeah, how can, how can leaders go about fostering that within their organizations? Yeah. Well, I think psychological safety, I think is a wonderful idea which may be unattainable for a start. I mean, I may be, you know, the most benevolent, wonderful boss in the universe, but quite frankly, if my workforce are carrying gigantic mortgages and the interest rates are going up, trust me, they don't feel safe. And there's nothing I can do to change that. Um, if there is a uh, very high unemployment, people aren't necessarily going to feel safe in a recession. There's nothing I can do to change that. So I'm not entirely persuaded that there is such a thing as psychological safety. I'm absolutely persuaded there's a thing called psychological danger you know, when you're working with bullies and psychopaths and just people who are inconsistent or dishonest or whatever. So I tend to think that social capital is a more, it's an idea with more stretch in it because what it is really captures are the kind of bonds of generosity, reciprocity and trust, which, which build and strengthen over time. And they pertain both to the people that I work with and to everybody that I know. And so if I'm stuck on a problem, it's really useful to think about who are all the people with whom I have social capital, with whom I have these norms of generosity and reciprocity and trust that might be able to help me. And the reason I think this is so important is frequently in business, I've been stuck on something. And because I framed it as a business issue, I have left out of my calculations that there may be people in my social life who know quite a lot about the problem I'm struggling with. I'll give you an example. When I lived in Boston, one of the things I was wanted to do is, and ultimately did do, is I set up a nonprofit organization to bring more live music into nursing homes for old people. And I did it because my mother had Alzheimer's and I was very alert to the fact that music is one of the very, very last things that people lose their memory for. Partly because it's one of the first things, one of the first experiences that they usually have. And I also knew that lots of um, music students didn't get enough performance experience. So I had this idea of let's bring them together. So wonderful idea, makes perfect strategic sense, you know. But then I discovered that people who run nursing homes are very, very protective of the people in them. 
and they don't really welcome outsiders. Uh, you know, they kind of not sure of their motives and they know that they have a duty of care to the people who stay there. So I keep thinking, how am I going to get somebody to see what a brilliant idea this is? You know? And um, and I'm talking to a friend of mine who says, well, why don't you just ask your um, your family doctor? Because he probably works with nursing homes or he'll know people who work in nursing homes. That absolutely unlocked the whole nursing home seg you know, sector. And it's what allowed us to do what we ultimately did. So, um, so you have social capital with all of the people with whom you have these, re these relationships of generosity and trust and so on. And it's important when you're stuck to think about who can help me. And that may include people who don't work with you. And understanding the value of that very uh, broad, non-specific network can be a huge asset. Um, it's also important because it gets you away from thinking hierarchically. And very often, very often, much more often than people like to imagine, the people who can help you may well be people who are junior to you, not because they're digital natives and all that kind of stuff, but just because where they are in the pecking order, they just see the world differently. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. I uh, I know from from facilitating all these mentorships, this notion yeah. of horizontal mentorship or this idea of two people open to learning from each other is critical. Like any hierarchy in the relationship more or less doesn't even allow the relationship to get off the ground. So they have to be open to, to learning from each other for the relationship to have that mutual respect there. But the, the thing within social capital that I, I love to dive into, because I know you mentioned this in your TED talk. Well, and this is around social capital, but around highly successful teams and how that all kind of fits the, the glue there. But you said that, that high, the most successful teams have a high degree of social sensitivity to each other, gave equal time to each other, and had more women on their teams. Um, essentially, what you conveyed was what happens between people counts. And I think sometimes, especially as we're working remotely, um, or just in general, where we're, we're putting up a, sometimes a lot of barriers between each other as we're living in these pandemic times, how can we go about creating those bonds, that glue, mm -hmm. so then people feel greater senses of social capital with each other to feel comfortable asking for help? Yeah, well, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, first of all, you you think about peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. I think it's such a brilliant thing to be doing. I wish people had been doing that, you know, when I was running my tech companies, I must say, because it would have helped me enormously. So I, you know, I really commend you and the people that you're working with for doing this, because I think it's it's just the best help there is, you know, because nobody has ulterior motives except to help each other. So I think that's brilliant. The tech talk you refer to cites uh, research by uh, um an academic named Thomas Malone, who works at the uh, Center for Collective Intelligence at MIT. And it's worth noting that after he did that research, which was real people face to face in real rooms, um, several years later, he did a, exactly the same experiment with virtual teams and found exactly the same thing. So in other words, his social capital was as important in virtual teams as with face to face in person teams. Um, and what I found working with, and this was before the pandemic, you know, working with companies like Novartis, which depend on global teams, uh, I found a couple of things. First of all, they put a lot of effort into their scheduled online time, into making time for non-work specific interactions. So they may have a book club. They may all watch the net same Netflix program and talk about that, but they do try, and it can feel a little clunky at times, but they really do try to make time to get to know each other as people. They will celebrate each other's birthdays. Um, you know, during the pandemic, I know a lot of companies that would send cooking kits around to people so everybody would cook, you know, lunch or dinner together. 
um, here in the UK, they'd send gin and tonic kits to each other so they could have cocktail hour together. Um, and I think this stuff really, really counts because it's about creating the context in which people see each other as people, not somebody on the org chart. And um, there's a wonderful researcher in, in Israel named Uri Alon. And Alon is a scientist and he's, he's famous for running a very, very, very productive lab. And he wrote a wonderful paper about, you know, how do you motivate a research team? And he said that one of the things that he did, every scientist in the world pretty much runs a two hour lab meeting once a week. But in Alon's meeting, the first half hour, you're not allowed to talk about science. Now, I'm married to a scientist. Scientists just want to talk about science. You know, they love talking about science. So this is kind of hard for them. Um, and science is really competitive and time is short, you know, so they want to crack on. But he said, you can talk about politics, you can talk about sport, your kids, theater, movies, whatever. No science for the first half hour. And what he said was, it really made people start thinking of each other as people. And the reason he did it is he said, you know, when, when the going gets tough and Anytime you're trying to do something new, it will get tough. You know, there'll be moments when you're just lost and confused and don't know which way is up. What will keep you going is the support and encouragement of your colleagues. And they will give you that instinctively because they care about you as a person, even though you may even be a rival, professional rival. And this is how he explains the huge productivity of his lab. And he says of himself, he found that, you know, this was kept, what kept him going as a scientist when he was, you know, really scared that he'd lost the plot. So I think this is really important. And, you know, I think we've been made quite a lot of headway in terms of soft skills coming to be seen as not squishy, right? <laughs> Being really meaningful. But I think that because we're all brought up to think that you know work has to be efficient, we tend to think, oh, you can't spend half an hour of a two-hour meeting just talking about cooking and birthdays and sport. It's a waste of time. It is not a waste of time when you know when things get tough. This is what motivates people, and it is what keeps people going. And certainly during the pandemic, I think many companies survived for the simple reason that that social capital was already in place. And my big concern now is that we make sure when we go back to work that we aren't in such a wild efficiency mode that we forget this stuff really, really counts. And it's funny you say that because it, I'll talk to a lot of leaders when I say, oh, you know, when you are in our mastermind group or in our pure or horizontal mentorship, it's about three to four hours per month. There, some of them are like, I don't have three to four hours per month to be with other leaders that can relate to my challenge. Yeah. Like, okay. And then a few months later, it's like it withers at them, it withers at them, it withers them away. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm so burned out. I got to do something new. I got to get out of here. I got to have some form of connection. And so I, I think that Absolutely. makes little sense. I'd be yeah. curious to know if, let's say I'm a, a leader watching you right now, I'm thinking to myself, okay, this makes a ton of sense. But right now, the culture that has been built in my organization has been very much rooted in rivalry and competition. How can I begin to replace that or at least bring in more social capital to my organization? What can I do now to start working towards a better future with my team and my culture? Yeah. Well, in some ways, I think um, now is an easier moment than ever because definitely making that cultural transition isn't simple. But in a way, the pandemic gives you the perfect excuse, right? We really lived off of the social capital we had built up in the past. We may be, you know, pretty much, we may have run out of it. So now when we, as we start to come back together again, we really need to pay tribute to the people who kept us all going, who often are the people in the lowest positions, right? They're, they're all the technicians and engineers and stuff who made all this stuff work. 
So I think there is a great moment for a reset. Certainly the great resignation would suggest there's a great need for a reset. And I think it's important to pay tribute to the fact that the companies that survived didn't survive because of one person. They didn't survive because of one superstar CEO or CTO or CFO or anything. They survived because everybody pitched in. So it's a great moment to pivot to a language of inclusion and everybody instead of the language of superstars. Because the language of superstars fosters competition that is incredibly corrosive, very wasteful, and very discouraging to the people who sit on the sidelines watching this kind of nonsense go on. And I think, you know, we've seen for all kinds of reasons the world move to a more collaborative model of working. Um, it's very clear that the big problems in front of us are not going to be solved by some superman or superwoman. Or super chicken. Uh, or super chicken. You know, we really need all hands on deck now in a bumpy economy, in a bumpy geopolitical situation, and a very threatening mm -hmm. climate, we need everybody. And that means we need to help each other and we need to be helped by one another. And the other thing I would say is, you know, in my most recent book, Uncharted, I wrote a chapter about business leaders who encounter just a completely unforeseen, unforeseeable existential threat in their business. And these are some of the most surprising, gut-wrenching interviews I've ever done in the sense that all the, the, for, the chief executives I interviewed at some point just remembering this, and these were guys who'd got through it, at some point they had tears in their eyes just remembering how painful this had been to the point that I had to ask them, well, good grief, if just remembering this stuff is so excruciating, what on earth kept you going? Because sometimes, you know, if there's a two or three year survival mode and every single one of them said the same thing to me. They said it was my colleagues and my, you know, and my friends who kept me going. When I got exhausted, they carried me. And when they were exhausted, I carried them. And one of them said rather bitterly, you know, longevity really counts. This was the opposite of the gig economy. And longevity is a kind of foundation of social capital, right? The longer you work with people, the stronger the team gets and the more you care about each other. And when the chips are down and in the future, the chips are going to be down sometimes. I'm an optimist, but that doesn't mean the sun is going to shine every day. This is what keeps you people going. Now, yeah, of course you need cash, right? In a crisis, cash is king. But if you don't have this really deep unspoken sense of commitment between people, the whole thing just blows away in the wind. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I that's, that's really fascinating. So there's a, there's a couple of things that I, I, well, there's one really big thing that I wanted to point out there because I still see this pervasive uh, notion within a lot of companies of they'll, prom they'll promote the best individual community contributor. So to your point about no superstars um, mm. and not wanting that, I see that a lot of companies are making potentially this mistake of saying, hey, you know, we're we're promoting this superstar. And, and so I when I made that comment about the super chickens, I was referring to if for anybody who's watching uh, in her TED talk, Margaret talks about this study done at Purdue about super or about chickens that are more productive in terms of egg producing. And um, this researcher would put all these eggs, the, these these chickens together. I think they should just see the TED talk. To be watch honest. the TED talk; it's really good. <laughs> um, great point. But the long story short is, is <coughs> a lot of companies that promote their best individual contributor based on their individual contributions, not on their ability to lead people. And so they think, okay, I've been this superstar. Now I'm going to try to elevate all these other people around me to superstar status but I've never actually been trained in management and the skills that made me great as an individual contributor don't necessarily make me great as a leader. Where do you see that gap or disconnect? How can we be better at identifying those, those great people leaders within our teams? Yeah. Well, there are a couple of things I'd say. I'd, the first thing I'd say is it's hard for me to think of a term that annoys me more 
than high potentials. People talk about, oh, we've got our hypos, you know, we've got our hypo program. And I think if that's what you call them, what do you think everybody else feels like? Does that mean I'm a low potential, no potential? If that's the way people see me, why am I even here? I don't want to work for people who think I have no potential. So I think, you know, I think it's just a horrible, crass, destructive language. The second thing I'd say is there are a whole bunch of companies which swallowed GE's rather pernicious um, proselytizing of forced ranking. Right, they really believed and they sold to the world the idea that if you really want to motivate people, you assess them every six or 12 months, you put them on a bell curve, you call the top 10% your high potentials and you send them off on fancy training courses and they are the princes and princesses of the organization and you throw out the bottom five to 10%. So that in theory, what that means is everybody wants to get to the top and everybody's scared of getting to the bottom. Well, first of all, fear generally is a very, very bad way to motivate people. So um, that's unfortunate that because the fear part at the bottom end of the bell curve is, is unhelpful. It also presupposes that you have five or 10% of your workforce are just duds, in which case that's a strange problem to have every single year, it suggests you're not learning. But the other thing that happens is that if being in this top five to 10% is such a cool thing, those people will never help each other. Because after all, if you and I are both in that hypo section and you ask me for help, I'm not gonna help you because you might go up the ranking and I might fall out of it. So not only will I not help you, I may subvert you. And I've seen this, you know, in companies where people, you know, spoil each other's presentations or don't provide a contact or a piece of information that would help or spread disinformation. I mean, it sounds childish because it is childish, but it does happen in things like competitive pitching. Anyway, this was, you know, this was the great, apparently the great success behind GE and companies like Microsoft absolutely swallowed it hook, line and sinker. And during the time that they did, they very famously missed the internet. They didn't have a web browser in development when Netscape went public. They never developed great database technology, although the whole of the internet runs on databases. They came very late to games. They missed mobile. And they came very late to natural language search. Now, for the most important software company in the world, that's a pretty dismal track record. And one of the things that was the first kind of early warning sign that, wow, Microsoft was just about to change its game was when Satya Nadella was made chief executive and he got rid of their forced ranking program because he could see how toxic it was. Microsoft had a viciously competitive internal culture where people would much rather make each other fail than succeed in and of themselves. And he understood that what needed to replace it was a growth mindset, not least because once you move everything to the cloud, everything has to collaborate. That's the whole point. So he made this very brilliant marriage between a collaborative culture and a collaborative technology. And I think very few people noticed that at the time, but I think that is now the kind of dominant mindset in most companies generally. Getting your top dogs to fight each other to the death is uninspiring for everybody around them. It fosters incredible amounts of dysfunction and aggression and waste. And you don't have to be a brilliant mathematician to understand that on a bell curve, the safest place to be is in the big fat middle. So just be ordinary. Don't be too good and don't be too bad. Keep your head down, be ordinary. Who wants to run that kind of organization? And who wants to work there? That's great. No, that's, that's really interesting. That's, uh, 
that's not particularly inspiring. So no, I, I think that's a great, great example you used of um, GE and Microsoft. That's awesome. Well, Margaret, this has been a really great lunch and learn. Um, this has been very informative, very insightful. Uh, you know, I think this is this has been fantastic. The last question I have for you is how can our leaders better learn more about you and the things that you've got going on? Sure. Well, I have lots of books out there. Um, my most recent book, which you can see piled up behind me, is Uncharted, How to Map the Future. Um, I wrote a little book for the TED organization called Beyond Measure. Um, but you can find all my books at, as they say, all good bookstores. Amazing. Margaret, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for being our guest. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Well, thank you, Garrett, for a wonderful conversation and, and good luck to all the people in your peer mentoring organization. I think it's a fantastic thing to be doing. And yes, make the three hours every month. It's really worth it. Totally agree. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah.